Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, Milan Vivere, Executive Director, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, Honorary Founding Chair, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Good afternoon, it's my honor to welcome all of you to Georgetown University and to Gaston Hall. We've come together today in recognition of extraordinary leadership in the promotion and protection of human rights. I wanna thank all of you for being with us this afternoon. It's truly an honor to be joined by so many distinguished guests, leaders in the international human rights community, the diplomatic corps, and members of the Georgetown family. I wish to take a moment to recognize the Honorable Hillary Rodham Clinton, for whom today's award is named, and who I will have the honor of introducing in just a moment. And our awardees this afternoon, the Right Honorable William Haig, Dr. Dennis Mukwege, and the current Secretary General of NATO, Anders Foe Rasmussen, who unfortunately is unable to join us today due to a meeting of defense ministers in Brussels. I'd also like to acknowledge His Eminence, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, Archbishop Emeritus of Washington. We're grateful for your presence here today. This gathering represents a significant moment for our community, one year since the official launch of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, led by Ambassador Milan Verveer, the first ever ambassador at large and director of the State Department's Office for Global Women's Issues. The work of the Institute resonates profoundly with our community as a Catholic and Jesuit institution animated by a deep commitment to social justice and the responsibility that we have to prepare our young women and men to address challenges that threaten peace, security, and human dignity. Already in its first year, the initiative has convened leaders, scholars, and practitioners in dialogue. It has provided a context for our students to more deeply engage these issues, and it has undertaken research to advance the broader dialogue on the role of women in conflict and peace. This is work inspired by all of you, and that seeks to inspire a next generation of leaders. Today, in this spirit, we are honored to present the Hillary Rodham Clinton Awards for Advancing Women in Peace and Security in recognition of the extraordinary leadership of Secretary Clinton and the contributions of our awardees. We all know that many in our world community, and especially women, are faced with significant challenges to their basic rights and the conditions that allow for human flourishing. But the seriousness of these challenges is met by the courage and determination of people like our honorees. This award honors their work and the longstanding contributions of Secretary Clinton to ensure that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights, as she said in her landmark 1995 address at the UN Fourth World Conference in Beijing. She has championed the rights and role of women for more than four decades, and in various roles throughout her time as First Lady, then as a United States Senator, and most recently while serving as Secretary of State. It was a privilege for us to host Secretary Clinton at Georgetown just a few years ago when she launched the United States National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And we are very honored by her leadership as the honorary founding chair of our Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Madam Secretary, it's always an honor to welcome you to Georgetown. We're grateful to have this opportunity to honor your work through this award. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce a distinguished and courageous public servant, an individual who has set an example for all of us through her leadership and service 
and who has inspired so many women and men from across our world to work together to ensure just, fair, and prosperous societies. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, once again, a great personal pleasure for me to be back on the campus of this great university and in this magnificent hall. I want to thank uh, President DeJoya uh, for his leadership and his vision about what uh, this university with such a storied past can mean to not only its own community but to the world now and into the future. And what a treat to join with my longtime colleague and friend, Ambassador Revere, in recognizing remarkable leaders and the work that they do on behalf of women, peace, and security around the world. This university has such an illustrious history of nurturing uh, diplomats and peacemakers. And of course, you do have uh, one former president who <laughs> still bleeds blue and gray. And so far as I'm able to determine, you now have the first institute on women, peace, and security in the world. Uh, so again, Georgetown. <laughs> Georgetown is truly setting an example. In addition to the distinguished visitors that uh, President DeJoya has already recognized, I also want to acknowledge the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Zeynep Bangura, who is here with us. Uh, when I introduced Resolution 1888 to the Security Council at the United Nations in 2009, it was just months after visiting with survivors of mass rape and brutality in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The goal was to bring together the international community to expand our commitment to combat sexual violence in conflict zones. And Special Representative Bangura is on the front lines of that fight every day. And I greatly appreciate her efforts. Today, we have the honor to recognize three leaders who are also on the front lines. I did not know this award would be named for me, but I am deeply honored that it is, and to be associated with these three gentlemen. And yes, all three are gentlemen. <laughs> that is not a mistake, it is a message. Ending sexual violence, advancing the rights and opportunities of women and girls is a responsibility that we all share. Women and men, senior government officials, courageous NGO workers and humanitarians, students at this university, all of us have a contribution to make. It's important at the outset to underscore that this is not a woman's issue. This cuts to the very core of who we are as human beings and what kind of societies that we choose to have. What kind of world we want to live in and leave for our children. When women are excluded and marginalized, we all suffer. We miss out on their experience, their knowledge, their skills, their talents. But when women and girls have the chance to participate fully alongside men and boys in making peace, in growing the economy, in political life, in every facet of existence, then we all benefit. And the three men we honor today understand this and have 
put their considerable prestige and efforts behind that. I am proud to call Foreign Secretary William Hague a friend. We worked together closely over the years and developed, like our countries, a special relationship. Now, under Secretary Hague's leadership, combating sexual and gender-based violence in conflict areas has become a priority for the United Kingdom. And he has taken this cause far beyond Whitehall. He's taken it to the United Nations Security Council, to the G8, to the highest levels of governments around the world. Secretary Haig has brought his trademark commitment, good humor, sharp wit, and determination to make sure that no meeting where two or more are gathered in the diplomatic landscape will not hear about the importance of this matter. Secretary Haig once shared uh, a quote from one of his illustrious predecessors with me, Lord Salisbury, who said, diplomatic victories come from far-sighted persistence among other admirable qualities. Now, this is what Secretary Haig has demonstrated. I know he would be a little embarrassed, perhaps, for me to go on and on, but I can't help but say that I know a little bit about what it's like to lead a diplomatic corps filled with incredibly talented people. And I can just imagine the conversations that must have taken place when he raised the idea that the United Kingdom, that the Foreign Secretary, would be a leader in this area. I can almost see the eyes beginning to roll a little bit. I mean, my goodness, we have, we have Syria, we have Libya, we have Iran, we have so much on our plate already. But what he understood and why I respect this decision of his so greatly is that those are not separate issues. Women, peace, and security are and must be recognized as being integral to dealing with all of those headline issues. Another remarkable man we honor today is Dr. Dennis McQuaig. It's hard even to describe to you what a difference this one courageous man has made. I met him when I traveled to Goma in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo as Secretary of State to raise the visibility of what was a terrible war that would, in fits and starts, continue to kill, by latest count, five million people, and where rape had long been used as a weapon of that war. Roughly 36 women a day, or 1,100 a month, reported rapes. There was no telling how many went unreported. I met with him at a roundtable discussion at the Heal Africa Hospital, where he shared the experience he'd had at the Ponzi Hospital that he had founded in Bukavu to provide treatment to survivors. He and his staff not only provide medical treatment to try to repair broken bodies, but rehabilitation and reintegration to try to repair broken hearts and spirits, giving these women a chance to reclaim their lives and their dignity. There are some of you whom I know have been in the Eastern Congo, so you understand what I am speaking of. But I don't think any of us can ever appreciate fully what he has meant, not only to the women who he has helped, but to the cause of peace and human rights. And 
with some prayers, perhaps we will see peace come to that beautiful but troubled region. The third honoree is not able to join us, but I do want to say a few words about Secretary General Rasmussen. He has boldly led NATO's efforts to integrate women, peace, and security into the alliance's operations. He understands. He was, after all, Prime Minister of Denmark. He understands that women are agents of change and drivers of progress, not just victims and survivors. Getting anything done in an organization like NATO, which is run by consensus, which means every member has to agree, is not easy. But the Secretary General has a talent for helping allies come together to make good decisions. I understand he will be at Georgetown next month to accept his award. Now here at Georgetown, at the Institute on Women, Peace, and Security, this idea of women driving progress has become the mantra. In country after country, we see so many examples of women acting as powerful forces for peace. And where conflicts have ended, and women are able to participate fully in their governments and their economies, we do see that countries do better. Forty years of data confirm that Countries where women are respected and integrated into the lives of their societies are less likely to resort to violence if they've been given a chance to be peacemakers and peace builders. So as President DeJoya said, that was the idea behind the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security for the United States that we launched here in Gaston Hall back in 2011. We're already seeing results. Between the State Department and USAID, the US government planned more than $130 million in foreign assistance for peace and security efforts, including women, in 2012 and 2013. That includes support to organizations, civil society, governments, partners working across the world. We've supported women's political participation and help them through training to build their own capacities in both the public and the private sectors. And we've supported women civil society leaders in the midst of conflict from Burma to Syria with programs that address advocacy, coalition building, negotiating, messaging, and conflict resolution. We've worked with the Department of Defense and the State Department together to promote efforts to advance all kinds of opportunities for women to participate. For example, the Global Peace Operations Initiative uh, began to look at how to improve the effectiveness of UN peace operations. So by now, I think you know, we believe that the work that's being done right here at Georgetown, the work that we honor with our three honorees is truly on the cutting edge. As part of this effort, uh, I will be through the Clinton Foundation uh, running a program called No Ceilings to look and see how far we've come since the landmark Beijing conference uh, back in 1995, the progress we've made, and how much more we have yet to do. That conference produced a platform for action. It led to a lot of what we celebrate today, such as the first resolution by the Security Council called Resolution 1325, uh, to so much more about national action plans and coordinated efforts. So I'm excited that we're going to see right here at Georgetown that the Institute uh, for Inclusive Security, started by my dear friend, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, and the Georgetown Institute are coming together uh, to announce an effort in support of this No Ceilings uh, initiative a National Action Plan Academy uh, designed to advance implementing uh, resolutions uh, 1325, bringing together delegations from around the world to focus on defense, police, and justice issues. I'd like Ambassador Swanee Hunt, the founder and chair of the Institute for Inclusive uh, Security, to please stand up so we can acknowledge your important efforts. <clears throat> So from our perspective, I think you can 
uh, deduce that we believe this is the unfinished business of the 21st century, giving women the tools and resources to break through the barriers that keep them from contributing to fully participating in their governments, economies, and societies. And I cannot think of a better way of kicking off this work than by honoring the three men, and particularly the two who are with us today. Thank you all very much. Dr. McWeggie, can we please have you come up on the stage? And as he comes up, I would like to tell you that in keeping with our international spirit, the awards that our honorees will receive this evening have been gifted to us by an extraordinary artist from the United Arab Emirates named Aza al Kubaisi. And we are so pleased that on this award, she depicts a dove, an olive branch, and the profile of a woman. And I want to thank the UAE ambassador who is with us, Yosef Aitabai, for joining us uh, this afternoon, but even more uh, for being such a friend of the Institute. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And now to the citation. For his tireless efforts to provide survivors of sexual violence with medical care and rehabilitative support in the ongoing conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. For his commitment to transforming the lives of the most vulnerable women. For his courage to continue this difficult but critical work in the face of great danger, and for his generous humanitarian spirit, his commitment to justice, and respect for the dignity of each human being, Georgetown University is proud to present the 2014 Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security to Dr. Denny McQuaggie. Secretaries, Ambassadors, President of Georgetown University, members of Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, distinguished guests and friends, thank you for giving me the floor in this prestigious academic institution. It is my great pleasure to be with you today among all of these esteemed guests and advocates for human rights, peace, and justice around the world. I greatly admire the work of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security here at Georgetown University, led by my good friend, Melan Vervier, and most certainly the vision of and voice of Secretary Hillary Clinton. We met for the first time when she visited the Democratic Republic of Congo to meet with Congolese women in her tireless advocacy for advancement of women and peace around the world. My friends, in 1999, we founded Pansy Hospital in order to reduce maternal mortality. Unfortunately, the first women we treated 15 years ago did not come for a C-section. She had been raped with extreme violence. It was the first time we had witnessed such a barbaric act, and we thought it was an isolated one, but it was the beginning 
of a humanitarian disaster of tremendous proportions that plagues us to this day. The bodies of women become the battlefield of conflict that has killed and displaced millions of people and which, in which rape has been used in a widespread and systematic manner as a weapon of war. Many of these atrocities have been committed by child soldiers, brainwashed by warlords and domestic and foreign armed forces to destroy communities and spoil natural resources of DRC. Since treating that first victim, Pansy Hospital and Foundation have developed a model of holistic assistance to address sexual violence. It includes medical care, psychological support, training and activity for economic, social, and political emanci emancipation and reintegration, and finally, free legal aid for survivors willing to seek justice in an effort to end impunity for these crimes. In addition, we are taking steps toward peace and change in the DRC through our program of community education and advocacy. We find our inspiration in the fierce determination of survivors who become actors for social change in their communities and are raising for the right and for peace. So, I accept this award today on behalf of these women, as I strongly believe that those who have endured violence in conflict times have the capacity to act as an agent for peace and security and deserve a place at the negotiation table in peace talks. I want just to let you know, the first time I was invited to the Security Council to talk about rape in conflict, a representative of a permanent, permanent member state of the council asked, why is this question discussed at the council? But now, it's finally recognized, including through UN Security Council Resolution 1820, that lasting peace and security can only be achieved when threats to women are seen as a threat to all. Rape is not... Rape is not only an attack on women and girls, but an assault on our common humanity. It's rightly recognized as a matter of international peace and security. The international community recently asserted a red line against the use of chemical weapons. Today, we need to establish a red line against the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. We all hold a responsibility to respond to these crimes that shock the conscience of humanity. States have a legal obligation to fulfill women's rights to a life free of fear and violence. And each of us, academicians, policymakers, students, and citizens have a role to play. Secretary Clinton, you are a model and an inspiration for all of us supporting women's rights and empowerment. Your dedication has changed the way the world perceives a woman, not only a person, but as a vocal citizen and a decision maker. 
Secretary Haig, you have tirelessly used all your leverage and political determination to bring about the recent adoption of declaration of commitment to end sexual violence in conflict, endorsed by the majority of states. I applaud the way you have constantly put the issue at the top of the international community's agenda. It's so crucial to continue to raise our awareness and galvanize political will at every level. Members of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, you have selected three progressive men, one political leader, one military commander, and one medical doctor to receive the 2014 Hillary Clinton Award for Advancing Women, Peace and Security. And this sends an important message. We can put end to sexual violence in conflict and in peacetime by pressing for greater political will, by taking on the responsibility to protect, and by healing and empowering survivors. But first and foremost, we must engage men and boys together with women and girls in the struggle to end patriarchal discrimination and gender-based abuses. Right now, the DRC, we are at a critical time. We have to translate words into action and seize the current momentum to bring about a lasting peace, sustainable development, and justice for all. We are encouraged by the recently adopted plan of action for implementation of regional benchmarks under the commitments of the peace, security, and cooperation framework agreement for the DRC and the region, signed by 11 states in Addis Ababa last year. Congolese women are expecting more than a reaffirmation of commitments or a reiteration of deep concerns. Their voice needs to be heard, and they must participate if you want to benefit from the dividend of peace and development in the Eastern Congo once and for all. We need continuous political will, both from the state of the Great Lakes region and from the international community. Let's work together, men and boys, women and girls, political leaders and civil society, to make this a more healthy, just, and peaceful world for all. I trust will prevail. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Secretary Hay, can we have you come forward, please? Secretary Hay. Sure. For his leadership in making the prevention of sexual violence in armed conflict a foreign policy priority of the government of the United Kingdom, and for raising this issue on the global security agenda, including the G8. For rallying international support to end the use of rape as a weapon of war, and to end the impunity of perpetrators of these crimes. And for using his powerful voice 
on behalf of women who have been victimized around the world, from Syria to the DRC. Georgetown University is honored to present the 2014 Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security to the Right Honorable William Hague, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. I'm delighted to be back at Georgetown University. I gave one of my first speeches as Foreign Secretary from this stage, and indeed one of my speeches much less noticed as a student in 1982 from Oxford University. And I'm very proud to return under these circumstances and under the auspices of the Institute of Women, Peace and Security. So, Mr. President of the University, Secretary Clinton, Ambassador Vavir, thank you for this immense honor. And it's always a great pleasure to work with Hillary Clinton. Everybody remembers who they shared a desk with at school. And Hillary and I, in a way, shared a desk for two and a half years when I was the brand new Foreign Secretary. Because at the UN Security Council and in meetings around the world, they usually seat the nations in alphabetical order, and the US and the UK are generally together, <laughs> often with the UAE just uh, next to us as well. Um, and she would silence any room just by walking into it. She always spoke the truth at these meetings fearlessly. And she was fond of passing notes during class, I have to say. <laughs> Um, I remember one that said, William, after this, let's go out and have some fun. <laughs> uh, which, which we did. <laughs> and Hillary, I believe you enhanced the standing of US diplomacy in the world. You strengthened the State Department. You created new opportunities for your country, breaking fresh diplomatic ground in Asia and Africa. You are one of the world's resolute champions of human rights. And in doing all these things and more, you placed the United States in a stronger position for the 21st century. You are a remarkable stateswoman, an outstanding American, and I'm very glad to call you my friend. Thank you very much. I am, of course, a conservative foreign secretary of the United Kingdom, while you were a Democrat secretary of state. But we, were, we have in common that we both believe that foreign policy is not just about responding to crises. Its goal must be to improve the condition of humanity. Yes, we must always be realistic about threats and dangers. But we must also always be fired with optimism about human nature and be bold in seeking out and sweeping away injustice. As nations, it is what we choose to do with our power that matters most of all, and that is the greatest testament to our values. And I believe there is no greater strategic prize for the 21st century than the full social, political, and economic empowerment of women everywhere. This, this must be the century in which women take their rightful place, in which hundreds of years of marginalization are forcefully and finally overturned and extinguished in which girls are born not into a world of narrow hopes and lesser protections, but into a world of equal treatment and boundless opportunity. Every country, including our own, has far more to do. But this is not just a national responsibility. It is a cause that every foreign minister should champion in a global effort to break down the barriers that hold women back and unlock their full potential. It requires all the ingenuity and persistence that diplomacy can bring to bear 
and should be part of the mission of each ambassador in every embassy of all democratic nations. We must turn commitments that exist on paper into education, jobs, equal participation, and leadership positions for women. We need to turn women's invisible presence in many countries around the world into a visible force in every society, with women represented in every peace process, in every government, in all walks of life. In my view, it is impossible to achieve that aspiration in a world in which the use of rape as a weapon of war goes unchallenged. Many men and boys are victims of these crimes. Their plight, too, must be brought out of the shadows. But sexual violence in armed conflict disproportionately affects women and is part of the crushing weight holding back women's development in many parts of the world. It is also a major factor in creating refugee flows and in perpetuating conflict. And it should be at the heart of how we view conflict prevention and foreign policy in this century. On this occasion, we must acknowledge that it is still considered unusual for a man and a politician to raise these issues. But rape and sexual violence are crimes overwhelmingly committed by men. And that they should happen while the world did too little should shame all men. Indeed, to shy away from talking about these facts is in itself unmanly. But that said, it is true that three women have inspired me and motivated me to take up this cause on top of what I have witnessed myself as Foreign Secretary. Two of them are my special advisors, Arminka Halich and Chloe Dalton, who have worked with me now for nine years. Among their many skills is the art of persuading me to do things. <laughs> and when I learned that I was to receive this award, they brought me down to earth by reminding me that the best way to get a man to do the right thing is to tell him that he's had an extremely clever idea. <laughs> when, when in fact it was their idea all along. <laughs> And perhaps that's what Hillary had in mind in awarding these awards tonight. <laughs> the, and the third woman who has inspired me is Angelina Jolie. Without her film, In the Land of Blood and Honey, my initiative on preventing sexual violence in conflict would probably not have existed at all. It brought home to me that an estimated 50,000 women were raped in Bosnia 20 years ago, and that still today virtually none of them have seen any justice. It made me think about Colombia, Rwanda, South Sudan, Somalia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, Liberia, Syria, the endless list of conflicts where women, children, and men have been brutally assaulted, often as part of a military strategy with total impunity. Sexual violence is often one of the first things that happens as soon as conflict or instability takes hold. Yet it is usually the last thing to be taken into account by those ending wars or rebuilding nations. Women bear the worst of the burden of war, but they have always benefited least from the peace. With this in mind, I asked Arminka and Chloe to invite Angelina to the Foreign Office to screen her film and to talk about these issues. They came back and said she wants to know something first. What are you going to do that will make a difference? And she was absolutely right. It, it is not enough just to watch a film or to meet and discuss these issues. We only get close to doing enough when we take action practical action that makes a difference to the lives of survivors. And out of those conversations was born our Preventing Sexual Violence Initiative and the campaign that has taken us together from London to the DRC, to the G8, to the UN Security Council, to the UN General Assembly, while the number of nations supporting us now has grown from eight to 140. <clears throat> Tonight, Angelina has just returned from Lebanon, where she has been working with refugees who are often survivors of sexual violence. Her extraordinary humility, her deep understanding of the lives of people uprooted by conflict, 
her remarkable ability to motivate people and governments around the world are central to the success of our work. And there is no barrier of language or culture that she's not able to overcome with her intelligence and charm and compassion. She is another credit to her country. And this summer, we will co-host a global summit in London, which we intend will be a summit like no other. It will be the largest gathering ever held on this issue, running for four days from the 10th to 13th of June. It will bring together not only foreign ministers from those 140 nations, but also members of their armed forces, police, judiciaries, and civil society. We will involve young people from around the world and open up the summit to civil society and groups working on these issues. It will be open to members of the public and interact with every form of social media and British embassies will stage events all around the world so that this summit continues 24 hours a day and people across the globe can participate. Achieving change in the world today requires a new and more open form of diplomacy that fuses the work of governments with civil society and the power of public opinion. And that is what we are going to bring together uh, on the 10th to 13th of June. We are going to ask these 140 countries to write action against sexual violence into their military training and doctrine and their peacekeeping missions overseas. We will encourage them to form partnerships to help the worst affected nations truly turn a corner on this problem. We will ask governments to plug the gaps in their criminal justice systems and pledge to make this a priority. And we will launch a new international protocol on how to document and investigate document and prosecute sexual violence in conflict to overcome one of the greatest barriers of all to justice, which is the lack of evidence. But we're going to be even more ambitious than that. We are setting out to change the whole global attitude to these crimes, as well as changing bureaucracies. We don't just want to move the pens of ministers, we are going to try to move the hearts of people. It is not enough to change countries' laws unless we change people's mentality. And we hope that to create, we hope to create so much momentum that we begin to shatter the culture of impunity so that in the future, even far from any judge or prosecutor or law, any man with a gun in any, in any conflict zone will think twice before ordering or committing rape as a weapon of war. There will be many people who say that this is too big a task, too difficult, or that it requires too much movement from the crooked timber of humanity ever to be successful. Other people say start with other less extensive crimes, arguing that sexual violence in conflict is something that has always happened and can never be eradicated. It is true that this task will take years and that it will be formidably difficult, and that if we don't end impunity, this problem will get worse, not better. But we cannot turn away from it. A society that believes in human rights for all human beings and opportunities for all its citizens cannot know about the way rape is used as a weapon of war and then simply ignore it. We cannot hope to end other forms of pervasive discrimination if we are unable to stand up to one of the most extreme forms of violence. If women are still treated in this abhorrent way in times of war, they will never be treated as equals in times of peace, and that cannot be tolerated. We know that the world is capable of agreeing that even during war certain actions are unacceptable, and we must remove rape and sexual violence from the world's arsenal of cruelty. So to receive this award tonight is a proud moment in my public career, and I accept it with humility. I accept it in the name of the survivors who find the courage to talk about their ordeal, who overcome their terrible injuries, who struggle on despite intimidation and ostracism and rejection by their families and societies. I hope these awards tonight are some recognition that those people matter and that they are not forgotten. And I hope it will encourage other men and other leaders to talk about these issues, 
since only then will we lift the stigma from innocent victims. And I accept this award thinking of the true heroines and heroes who work with survivors of rape, doctors like Dr. McQuaggy, nurses, human rights defenders, lawyers, thousands of women and men who have done far more than I have, most with no reward or acknowledgement. They have done for years what governments have failed to do, and we must follow their example. And I accept it also with humility, because although I'm proud of what we have achieved so far, it is only a beginning. I will continue this campaign for as long as it takes. I'm grateful to the men and women of the British Foreign Office who are working across the world in support of it, and to the NGOs whose years of indispensable work we want to build upon. I'm greatly encouraged by this award and by knowing that we are all part of this same endeavor. By taking up this cause, we are shouldering a responsibility that our world has shirked for too long. And having taken it up, now we must never set it down again. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> We have a uh, tradition here at Georgetown of giving our students an opportunity to ask questions of our distinguished guests. Uh, we recognize we have very little time, but we want to uh, ensure that we get a couple of questions in. So Secretary Haig, and this comes from Victoria Haddad Sala. She is uh, in the graduate program in foreign service here, and she's obviously already thinking about difficulties in diplomatic life. Because her question to you is how you coordinate uh, the prevention of sexual violence and conflict initiative that you have birthed within the UK government, you're in the foreign ministry, with the defense ministry, with DFID, your development agency, and more broadly internationally across that spectrum of agencies you just mentioned in your speech. How does coordination get done? Well, that, of course, is a challenge in any government uh, in the world. And the bigger the government, the bigger the challenge uh, is. I'm glad to say that having started out on this, there's great enthusiasm for us to do this work in the British government, and I think in many other governments around the world. And there are some things in government where you spend a lot of time getting collective agreement, and then you set out on something. There are other things where you just set out. <laughs> and collective agreement kind of follows you along. Uh, and I think this is one of those. Um, uh, but the enthusiasm is there. Our Department for International Development, which has one of the biggest development budgets in the world, um, is, is very supportive and indeed is... Um, uh, dedicates uh, considerable funds uh, to trying to prevent uh, sexual violence, to measures in refugee camps and displaced persons camps that help people uh, on the ground. So we have that coordination in the British government, um, and I think increasingly we have it internationally. Um, and uh, I, I, what I said earlier is very important, I think, about how these days the coordination of, a, of action on a global issue isn't just for governments on their own. Uh, I, key, I call meetings, uh, such as the one at the UN General Assembly, where uh, 140 nations uh, ended up supporting our declaration. But all the time you need the work of civil society, of the NGOs, of public opinion, of social media. And fusing these efforts together is really the way in a networked world to uh, make rapid progress on an issue. So um, it's no longer, coordination on these issues in the world is no longer a matter of just calling meetings. It is about harnessing public opinion. That's why I want the summit that I'm planning in June to be like no other that has ever been held. Um, and um, you watch, you participate. That will, that will help make it like no other that's ever been held. And we hope you succeed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. McQuaggy, 
As a doctor, you help heal survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. But how do you help repair the psychological damage suffered? And how do you help women rebuild their lives? This is a question from Sarah Cochran, who's a master's student in German and European studies. Thank you. When women come at our hospital, most of them come before because they have injuries on their genital party. And uh, for us, before, it was just to treat this wound and let them uh, return uh, uh, home. But at the end, we, we saw that it was not enough because uh, when women are raped, it's not only the wounds that they have, but it's uh, their own personal integrity who is touched and or attempt. So when you take care of women after to be raped, you have to see the holistic way to treat them. And I think that the psychological uh, uh, support is very important because even before to make surgery, sometimes we need to be sure that women are enough strong to support the trauma of the surgery. So if you start with surgery before to be sure that she is able to support this trauma of surgery, sometimes they can decide just to don't eat after the operation. They can decide to just let them die. So we need really, when you are treating uh, um, sexual violence, uh, uh, the consequence of sexual violence in the hospital to think about the psychological support. It's very important to think about it. Even when you want to reintegrate women in their community, you need to be sure that they are enough strong psychologically to <clears throat> face the, the, the stigma, to, to be able to be reintegrated in the community. They have to face the stigma. And if they are not enough strong psychologically, they can't. So to rebuild their life, I think that we need to go step by step. But psychologically, step is very important. Thank you. And this last question is for both of you. And it is from Hannah Peswick, who is a master's student uh, in Arab studies. How do we mobilize political will to ensure that women are part of the solution to violent conflict? And what do you tell skeptics of integration of women's in, women into the decision-making process related to peace and security? How do we persuade? Well, um, persistently, um, I think, is the answer to that. And we must take every opportunity to do so. Uh, it is still an uphill struggle. Um, for instance, we have just been holding the, um, uh, the, another round, Geneva II, as it has been uh, called, uh, a round of peace negotiations to find a political solution in Syria. And I have been advocating the inclusion of women to a much greater extent in that process, um, to the, uh, advocating that to the UN Secretary General and to other nations. And, and some efforts have been made in, the, in parallel uh, with the negotiations that just took place in Geneva. Uh, women were um, a group of leading women from Syria were there in parallel, and I went to talk to them about it, but they, they should not just have been in parallel. Um, for this process to succeed, they're going to have to be much more included. Um, and we encourage the Syrian opposition, the National Coalition, to include women in their delegation to the peace talks, which they did. Uh, but I think whenever there is such a, con and even a much smaller uh, conflict, we have to make that effort and not let one of these um, uh, occasions go by without pointing out that we're more likely to find a lasting solution with the involvement of leading women from that society. And it is more likely to work in the future. If we believe everything that we have passed in UN resolutions, then we should act on it each time. Uh, and so we have to do that, and in the, the nations of the world represented on the Security Council must um, always make this case. But we will have to do so very persistently because, of course, um, there, are many, it, there haven't been many such peace negotiations uh, where women have been already in a leading role. Where they have been, though, it has been successful. I just came back from the Philippines uh, a few weeks ago, 
and their leading women in the Philippines have played an important role in the Mindanao peace process, um, which now has, has made progress undreamt of a few years ago. Um, and and their, their role has been absolutely crucial to it. So the evidence is growing that we're on to something Onward, here. as we say. <laughs> Dr. McWeggy. Thank you. I think that uh, peace and security is an issue of humanity. And uh, I can't understand why we can put a half of our humanity when you are talking about peace, and especially when you know that uh, most of the conflicts are uh, provoked by men. And when it comes to discuss about peace and how to build uh, peace and security, how we can't put them out of our talks. I think that this is not only something we need to change the way uh, to, to get dialogue with, with women. It's not, uh, they have not negotiated because I think that they are part of our humanity. So they must be where we are discussing, especially when it comes uh, the talk about peace and security. It's not a man issue, it's a humanity issue. So we have to be together to discuss about it. Thank you, and thank you both again for... I'm going to go back downstairs. Before we conclude, I have a few special announcements. We are honored to announce today that Regina K. Scully, as a founding sponsor of the Founders Circle of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, is endowing a Hillary Clinton Fellowship in Perpetuity. The fellowship will enable a Georgetown graduate to engage in research and analysis on a range of critical issues relating to women's participation in peace building, post-conflict reconstruction, and fostering democratic political transitions. Among her many achievements, Regina is a documentary film producer who is known for her issue-focused works, including the award-winning Invisible War. And we are so grateful to her for her leadership and commitment. Regina, can you stand up wherever you are? We also want to thank committed members of the university community, Congressman John Delaney and April McLean Delaney, for their generous gift to the Georgetown University Law Center to support a Hillary Clinton Fellowship for a graduate of the Law Center beginning June of this year for five successive years. The fellow will focus on research, analysis, and reports on international law, human rights and actions of international organizations and governments in the area of women, peace, and security. This fellowship obviously directly aligns with the mission of the Law Center, which was founded on the principle that law is but a means, justice is the end. The Delaney's please stand, please. And we are also pleased to announce that an inaugural Hillary Clinton Fellowship is being established by the Honorable Mac McClarty, his wife Donna, and their sons Mark and Franklin through the McClarty Global Fellowship Program. Mark McClarty was a Georgetown graduate. The research fellowship will provide funding for a graduate of the Clinton School of Public Policy at the University of Arkansas to serve as a fellow for one year at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. So this represents both a generational commitment and a collaboration between two academic institutions, and we're very grateful to the McClarty's. And finally, I want to welcome two very special guests who have traveled from Zurich to be with us today. 
Drs. Christiane and Nicholas Weikart. We are very grateful to them for their founding support for the Institute's International Consortium, which connects research centers and universities around the world that are working on issues related to women, peace, and security in order to foster greater collaboration and to bring top academicians together with expert practitioners. So we thank the Weikarts also. Again, congratulations and gratitude to our honorees, to Secretary Clinton for all you do, and to each of you for joining us today, but more importantly, for all you do to create a better world for all. So thank you all so much, and we ask that you remain seated while the delegations depart. Good evening.